All right, today we are talking about buffers and how we do calculations involving buffers. Now, buffers work on the same ice table principles that we've been dealing with uh, for the past several weeks. So in terms of ice tables, there's nothing new there, but there are some modifications that we're going to have to make to our ice tables in order to do calculations with buffers. So let's talk about the common ion effect first. So you make a solution. You take sodium acetate and you dump it into some water, right? So actually that would be uh, NaC2H3O2 AQ, right? That's really not appropriate way to describe it though because this is soluble. That means that it's really sodium ion and acetate ion, right? But a very, 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 very tiny percentage of it could stay together, but it's not going to be an amount that you would care about. And now you add some acetic acid to this solution. Okay, there's the formula for acetic acid. What do these two equations have in common? They both contain acetate, right? So if I've got this reaction and this equilibrium in effect, and I add acetic acid, right, what am I essentially doing? I'm adding something that's already in the solution, right? Now, if we think back to Le Chatelier's principle, will the stuff that I added really dissolve all that well? Because think about it from Le Chatelier's principle, right? If I've got a product and I increase its concentration, which way is the equilibrium going to go? It's going to go away from it, right? Your beaker, your, your molecules are able to tell which ones were in there already and which ones were added, right? Molecules are stupid. They can't say, oh, hey, you're from sodium acetate, but you're from acetic acid. There's no distinction, right? There's no way that your molecules can tell which ones were in there already and which ones we've added. So in other words, if this acetate ion is already in my beaker and I add some acetic acid, that's essentially, when this thing tries to dissociate, that's essentially increasing the concentration of a product, right? Think like that to the Chatelier's principle. So your, your equilibrium says, hey, we've increased the concentration of a product. Therefore, we're gonna shift equilibrium this way. So the answer to the question, will this dissolve if acetate is already in the beaker? The answer is what? No. Right? The answer has to be no. It's not, it, it might dissolve a very, very small fraction because acetate is in there already and it's preventing more acetate from dissociating from the acetic acid. Does this make sense? If this thing tries to dissociate, the concentration of a product goes up. In other words, it shifts it back. It says, nope, you're not dissolving. I've already got acetate in here. Can't have any more. The Chatelier's principle says, if I increase the concentration of a product, I shift the equilibrium away from the product towards the reactant. Does this make sense? This is the premise on how a buffer works. Okay, any acetate that we try to add isn't going to try isn't going to dissolve very well because acetate's already been put in my beaker. So this is Le Chatelier's principle. In other words, if the acid can't dissolve, then it can't affect the pH either. Hey, that's great. If I want a beaker full of a liquid that will resist changes in pH, this is a good way to do that, right? So this is a buffer. And these two are called common ions. This was in there already. This was what I tried to add. So that's called the common ion effect, right? Your solution doesn't know that this acetate's any different from this acetate. It just says, hey, acetate's in there already. It's a common ion. When I try to add acetate, it's going to say, nope, can't dissolve it. Shift it back this way. And so buffers work on Le Chatelier's principle. If the solution contains a weak acid and its conjugate base, I've got both the acid component and the base component, right? Now I've got a situation where I've got a solution that can resist changes in pH. And that's a good thing. You need to know this. How would I make a buffer? How would you make a buffer? If I put this as a test question, tell me how to make a buffer. What are the two requirements? You must have a weak acid. You can't use a strong acid because strong acids fully dissociate, right? There's no percent dissociation with a strong acid. Weak acids are the way to go because weak acids only partially dissociate, right? If you deal with a strong acid, equilibrium's all the way on the products all the time. You can't really do anything about it. But with a weak acid, because a weak acid is variable, 
you can shift that equilibrium from side to side a lot more easily. So it's got to be a weak acid and it's got to be its conjugate base. You got to have both the acid component and the base component. Because otherwise you've just got a beaker of acid or a beaker of base, right? You've got to have both. You've got to have the acid component and the base component. Now when you combine an acid and a base, think back to like seventh grade science, right? What happens when you add an acid to a base? They neutralize each other, right? Acids and bases neutralize each other, right? So when you add any acid to any base, you're going to get water and you're going to get a salt. Okay, the salt is just the leftover cation and the anion. So for instance, hydrofluoric acid is a strong acid, sodium hydroxide is a strong base. When I combine them together, I get water, right? OH and H get together, that makes my water. Na and Cl get together, that makes my salt. Right? This is just a double displacement reaction. And this is how buffers do their jobs. Because if I've got acid in my buffer, and I've got base in my buffer, whether or if I add base, it would react with the acid. If I add acid, it would react with the base. So you've got this perfect storm where any acid I add is gonna get consumed, or any base that I add is gonna get consumed, because acids and bases neutralize each other. And so tomorrow in lab, you're gonna do an experiment. You're gonna look at buffering capacity. You're gonna look at all kinds of neat stuff with buffers. But here are two solutions. They're just colored pink with indicators so you can see changes in pH. This one is buffered and this one is not buffered. Initially, they're both at 5.04, okay? And now we add some acid to both of them. We add acid to the one that's buffered. We add acid to the one that's not buffered. The one that was buffered, its color didn't change, right? Its pH didn't change. Whereas the one that was not buffered, its pH dropped big time, dropped down to 2.33. Now remember, the pH scale is logarithmic. So if you go down a unit, that's a 10 times increase. So you went from five down to two. So you've increased your acidity way ton. Whereas when we added it to the buffer, the buffer contained a base that ate up all that acid that I added. And that's why the pH didn't change. So does everyone understand the concept of a buffer? Because if you don't understand what a concept is, I mean what the concept is, none of the math is going to matter. Okay, because if you don't understand the premise of a buffer and how it works. We can do calculations until you're blue in the face. Is everybody with me on the concepts? What a buffer is. It contains an acid component, a base component. Thus, any acid or base we add can be consumed. Is everyone with me conceptually? Okay, because if we're not together now, and we're wasting our time doing calculations, right? Buffering means that if I add acid, pH stays constant, or if I add base, Right? Unbuffered means if I add acid or base, pH is off to the races. And this is what I just said, right? Logarithmic scale means if you drop the pH from two to one, that's 10 times increase. But if you go from one to one down, 1.1 down to 1.0, that's a small change, right? Because this is a 10 fold increase. This would not be a 10 fold increase. Some things in the real world that are buffered. The one that I think everybody in this room appreciates most is blood, right? When we're carrying out respiration at a cellular level, we're releasing CO2, right? That's an that's a acid, carbonic acid. Why would it be bad from a homeostasis standpoint if your blood pH is just going all over the place, right? That'd be a, a train wreck. Your pH can't vary all over your body. You would be in big time trouble. Um, if you ever look at shampoos and lotions and that sort of thing, they contain buffers. And that's to resist bacterial growth. So you can actually look at the labels. And it won't say buffer, but those things are in there as weak acids and bases to resist bacteria from growing in them. So the pH doesn't get down or up to an optimal level where bacteria can grow. You don't want, you know, getting sepsis from your shampoo. Okay, so what's the generic reaction of a buffer? Well, the generic reaction of a buffer is the same thing as the generic reaction of any acid, okay? So any acid has the same generic reaction as the general reaction for a buffer. HA plus H2O is in equilibrium with H3O plus and A minus, okay? We're gonna use the weak acid version to make our buffers here. We're gonna look at buffers made from weak acids. 
This is why we're using the general reaction for a, a buffer from an acid perspective. Okay, so the generic reaction for a buffer is the generic reaction you've already learned for an acid. That's easy, saves you some memorization, saves some space on your mental hard drive, right? Because you already know the general reaction for any acid. If you just tell yourself, okay, the general reaction for any acid is the same as the general reaction for a buffer, then that's one less thing to memorize. Yay! Everybody with me here? We remember this reaction, right? We haven't forgotten this from two weeks ago. We're still, we're still good on this? Okay. So now let's do some calculations involving buffers. What do we do to calculate pH of a buffer? What do we do to calculate pH of a buffer after we add acid? What do we do to calculate pH of a buffer after we add base? These are all things that you're going to need to know for lab tomorrow and for your homework this week. So let's just do pH of a buffer before we've added anything to it yet. We want the pH of just the buffer, nothing else. Okay? So we haven't added anything to it yet. So let's do this one together. It's a really easy calculation if you understood last week's stuff. If weak acid and weak base calculations were easy for you, then buffer calculations will be easy. We just have to make one tiny little modification to our ice table. So let's calculate the pH of a buffer that we made using 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0.4 molar sodium acetate. And just so you know, the Ka of acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. So I'll give you a second to jot this down. 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0.4 molar sodium acetate. And there's the Ka. If you ever need a Ka on a test, where would it be? Is that something I'm gonna make you memorize? No, it'll be on your reference page, okay? Ka's will be um, on the reference page. Unless, of course, it's a problem asking you to calculate Ka. But you're not going to be calculating Ka for a buffer, so that's good. Are you ready to go through this example? 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0.4 molar sodium acetate. We all good? All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to make an ice table just like we did last week. We've just got one tiny little new twist to add to that. And then we're gonna calculate H3O plus in order to get pH, right? That's what we did last week too. We had to figure out hydronium ion concentration in order to get pH. Well, we're gonna do that this week too. So really, if, like I said, if last week made sense, this week's gonna be a cakewalk. So here's my ice table. Now here's the new part. Here's the new part. It was made from 0.5 molar acetic acid. That part's the duh statement, right? That was what we were doing last week. But last week, we had zero and zero here, right? Last week it was 0.500, because 0, 0, it was just acetic acid. But now it's acetic acid and sodium acetate. That's my A minus, right? So this value is not zero. It's whatever the problem tells you the salts concentration is, okay? This is the new part. This is the new part. We did this last week. I said calculate the pH of a 0.5 molar acetic acid. That was 0 0.500. Well, that was just plain acetic acid. But now it's acetic acid and sodium acetate's already in there. Okay, so that's why this is not zero. If you understand why this isn't zero, then this is all, now all the same as last week. It's exactly the same as what we did last week. The only difference is this is not zero. Okay, if you put this as zero, you're not calculating the pH of a buffer, you're calculating the pH of just the acetic acid. That's not the same thing as the pH of the buffer. And we're gonna make the 5% approximation twice, right, because we've got this value, X is gonna be a very small number, so we're making the 5% approximation here and here, okay, because our Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. This is reactive vapor. Do you understand how we set up this ice table and why this value isn't zero? Does everybody see why this is 0.4? Because the problem said it was 0.4. That's where it came from. Okay, so now I'm just doing exactly what I did last week. Write my Ka expression, H3O plus times acetate, boom, boom, over acetic acid. 
right? And now I just plug in all my values. X goes there, 0.4 goes there, and 0.5 goes there, and I get a value of 2.3 times 10 to the negative fifth as X, right? That's the value that goes in here. So how do I get the pH? I just take the negative log of X and I get 4.64. Two decimal places, and two sig figs here means two decimal places here. So literally, it's the exact same as last week with just one teensy tiny little modification. If you forget and put this as zero, you're not calculating the pH of the buffer, you're calculating the pH of just the acetic acid. Make sure that you put both values in your ice table. This is gonna make a big difference. No square root this time, right? Because it's not x squared on the top anymore, it's now 0.4x, okay? So no square root this time. How do we feel about doing this pH of a buffer? Just the buffer, we haven't added any acid, we haven't added any base. Everybody good on calculating pH of just the buffer? Plain, nothing added to it yet. All right, now let me show you something. I think you'll like this. Here's the generic equation for a buffer. This is also the generic equation for any old acid. Right, there's the Ka expression. Now, if I take this Ka expression and I rearrange it so that I'm solving for H3O+, plus, this is what I get, right? If I just rearrange it and solve, and so I'm solving for H3O+, plus, this is what I get. Now, if I take the negative log of, both, of everybody and I apply my logarithm rules, this is what I get. It's called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. These two equations will be on your reference page and guess what? If you take your values here, this is A minus, this is HA, you can just dump them in and you've got your stuff ready to go, right? Because there's H3O plus. How would I then convert that into pH? I just take the log, right? Or if you want to take the log first, you would turn your Ka into a pKa and then plug in your values from your ice table. So these two, uh, these two um, equations will be on your reference page. If you're doing a homework question that asks you to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, don't let that throw you off. That's just meaning you can do this. But this and this are the same thing. The only difference is you've taken the negative log to go from here to here and rearranged. So they're the same thing. And both of these come from just the regular old Ka expression. So you can use these to find pH of any buffer because these values are coming from your ice table. So you just dump them, dump them, punch, 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 and I'm done. All right, so you try this one. Calculate the pH of a buffer consisting of 0.75 molar nitrous acid and 0.5 molar potassium nitrite. And the Ka of nitrous acid is given right here. I'll pause it and let you try. So, see what we got. <clears throat> we're gonna write our dissociation equation, right? Gotta do that first. And then we're gonna set up our ice table. The only difference between this week and last week is that this week we now have A minus, right? We now have anion in the solution, whereas last week we were just dealing with acid only. Now we've got a buffer, which means we've got anion in there already. We're gonna make the 5% approximation twice because this is a weak acid, right? So, I plugged into the first version of our handy reference um, equations. You could have done it the second way. You're gonna get the same answer, right? 3.17. Because if you use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, what you would have done is you would have turned this Ka into a pKa, and then plugged in your A minus and your HA and you still would have got the same answer. Two decimal places because you have two sig figs in our molarity. Did you get it right? 3.17? Any questions on how to calculate the pH of just a buffer? Now remember, this is just the plain buffer. We haven't added anything to it yet. We're just calculating the buffer. So is everyone with me on how to calculate pH of the buffer by itself? Yes? It's just like last week except one minor detail difference. But this is not really very useful to us because what's a buffer if you're not gonna do something to it? 
right? So now we need to learn how to calculate pH after adding base, and then how to calculate pH after adding acid. So let's do pH of base first. So why would adding base increase the pH of my buffer? If it's gonna increase the pH at all, I mean, if it's gonna change the pH at all, why would it be an increase? Why would a base increase pH if it's gonna change it at all? Because what's the pH range of a base? Greater than seven, right? So you would expect that after you add base, the pH, if it changes at all, is gonna go up, right? So you can always use that as a benchmark to ask yourself if your answer is reasonable. So let's calculate adding base. And we're gonna do this one together. You make a buffer using 0.5 molar acetic acid, and there's its Ka, and 0.5 molar sodium acetate, right? So the molarity of both the acid and the conjugate base is the same. What's the pH of this buffer after we add 0 0.020 moles of solid sodium hydroxide to a one liter sample? So we take a one liter sample of this buffer and we add 0 0.020 moles of solid sodium hydroxide. We just scoop it out, dump it in, stir, stir, stir. What's my new pH going to be? Okay, does everyone understand the premise of the question? All right, I'll give you a second to jot it down, and then we'll go through how to calculate pH after adding base. It's not going to be the same procedure that we'll use for pH after adding acid. So we really want to make sure we differentiate here. What do you do when you add a base versus what do you do when you add an acid? Right, because adding base is going to react with the acid of the buffer, whereas adding acid is going to react with the base of the buffer. So we have to look at it from two different angles. This is base that we're adding, so the calculation is going to be slightly different than calculation for an acid. 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0.5 molar sodium acetate. Taking a one liter sample, we're adding 0 0.02 moles to it. Just FYI, what if I had given this, instead of giving it to you in moles, what if I had given it to you in grams? Could you still have done this? Yes, because you know how to calculate grams to moles, right? So let's talk about the chemistry of what happens. Because again, if you don't understand conceptually what's going to happen, then calculations are a waste of your time. Let's talk about what's going to happen in terms of the chemistry. The hydroxide that we add is going to completely react with the hydronium that was in the buffer already, right? With the acid component specifically. So this is going to give us a new HA and A minus which will then figure out and um, plug into our equations that we just talked about. So the first thing we need to do is we gotta find out the concentration of the base, right? The problem says that we added 0 0.020 moles to one liter, right? Well, what's the formula for molarity? Molarity is moles over liters, right? So it's 0 0.020 moles over one liter, ta-da! Again, if I had given this to you in grams, let's say I said you add uh, 0.1 grams, you would have to obviously convert that to moles first, right? So molarity is moles over liters, so moles over liters. So the concentration of the hydroxide that I added is 0 0.020 moles per liter. Is everybody good on how we got this value? Yes? Because remember, ice tables only deal with molarities. Ice tables don't deal with grams and all that garbage. So if I had given this to you in grams, make sure you convert it into moles. Also, ice tables only deal with molarity, right? So that means that if this was in milliliters, make sure you convert it to milliliters before you plug it into your molarity. Now, what's gonna happen? The acid plus the base is gonna produce water and the salt. So the base that we add is gonna react with the acid, right? So this is what was in there already, right? This was the acetic acid that was in the, the buffer already. This is what I added. Acid plus base makes water and salt. Now I'm only interested in the net ionic equation. Sodium ions is spectator, right? So here's what's really happening. Acetate is reacting with hydroxide that I added, getting water, excuse me, acetic acid is reacting with hydroxide to give me water and acetate. 
Okay, sodium is a spectator. This could be lithium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, whatever, right? We don't care what this cation is. We're only interested in the net ionic equation. So thinking back to last semester. And the reason we're keeping this together is because it's a weak acid, right? It's dissociating very little. So this is the equation that I'm going to base my ice table off of, okay? So now I've got to figure out what are my new concentrations. That's where my ice table comes in. The problem told me that it was 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0.5 molar sodium acetate. So that's why these values are 0.5 and 0.5, right? That was in the buffer already. That's numbers that I got directly from the problem. I always wanted to explain where my numbers are coming from. The problem told me it was 0.5 molar. The problem told me it was 0.5 molar. Now this is what I added, right? I just figured out the concentration of hydroxide. I added this. And I am assuming that it's going to completely react. That means that its value is going to go all the way down to zero. So if this goes down by 0.02, what's going to happen to this? It's going to go down by 0.02 which means what's going to happen over here? It's going to go up by 0.02. Just think back to the very first ice tables we made way back in like week three, right? If it goes down by a certain quantity on the reactants, it's going to go up by that same quantity on the products. Law of conservation of mass. Does everybody understand where these values came from? Does everybody see how this E column came into existence? I should say E row, equilibrium values. This was from the problem, this was from the problem, this is what we added. We're assuming it's gonna fully react, that means it's going all the way down to zero. So that I subtract it from the reactants and I add it to the products. Now that I've got these values, I have everything I need to plug in to my equation. So I can use one of my equations, which is what I recommend, it's less writing. But you could make another ice table and do that again, if you really wanted to. But if you plug it directly into the equations that I just showed you a couple minutes ago, Henderson-Hasselbach or the H3O plus equation, you've got everything you need, right? Because those equations need HA and A minus. HA, A minus. So here's what it looks like if you plug into one of these. I'll show you both versions. You'll get the same answer either way. So if you use this version, here is your HA, here is your A minus, and the KA was given in the problem. We get 4.78. Here's what it looks like if you use this version, A minus, HA. How do I get a pKa? Problem only gave me Ka. How would I convert that into a pKa? Take the negative log, right? If the Ka is 1.8 times 7 negative fifth, that means the pKa is this. So really, the deciding factor is, do you want to take the log at the beginning? Or do you want to take the log at the end, right? If you plug into this one, you'll take the log as your last step. If you plug into this one, you'll take the log at the beginning to get a pKa. So really, I don't care. You're going to get 4.78 regardless. Because these two are the same. One's just the negative log version of the other. So if you want to use this one and take the log at the end, that's how it looks. If you want to take the log at the beginning to get a pKa, then that's how it looks. You get the same answer either way. Now maybe you say to yourself, you know what, henderson hasselbach equation just confuses me. It's extra something to think about. I don't want to deal with these equations. They're a pain in my neck. That's fine. You don't have to do it this way. You have a second choice. You could take these values right here and make a second ice table. Just like you're taking a regular old any other ice table. Right, you're making the 5% approximation. There's Ka, plug, plug, off to the races, take the log. Because remember, those equations that I just showed you came from this. So essentially, you're doing the same thing. It's just a matter of how you present it. You're gonna get the same answer no matter which method you choose. You just pick the one that you like, the one that makes sense, the one that you can do the arithmetic for. Either way, conceptually, it's all the same. And both Henderson-Hasselbach and the other version came from the Ka expression. 
Does everyone see how we got 4.78? Now let's compare. The buffer by itself was 4.74. I added base, it went up to 4.78. Is that reasonable? Would you expect pH to go up after adding a base? Yes. Is this a big change in pH? This is the tenths, this is the hundredths, right? So I went up by four hundredths of a pH unit. In terms of the fact that this is a logarithmic scale, is that a large change in pH? Logarithmic scale, tenfold, right? If this went from four to five, that's ten time increase. This went from the hundredths place up to the hundredths place. So is that a big change of pH? No, it's not. All right, you try this one. You make a buffer using 0.8 molar hydrofluoric acid, and there's its Ka, and 0.8 molar potassium fluoride. So I want you to calculate the pH of just the buffer by itself, so you can have a baseline. Then I want to calculate the pH after we add 0.1 moles solid potassium hydroxide to a one liter sample, and then compare before to after and decide is this a good buffer. I'll pause the recording, let's try this one. Let's go over this one, see what we got. <clears throat> so here's the pH of just the buffer. It's 0.8 molar of the acid component and 0.8 molar of the base component. So anytime these two values are the same, the pH is just going to be the pKa, right? Any two, anytime these two values are the same, 0.8 over 0.8 is 1. So this drops out. So what's the pH? Well, it's just the negative log of the Ka. In other words, it's the pKa. So that's where we started, right? You also could have used the anderson hasselbalch equ equation. Again, this component drops out, pH equals pKa. Do we agree on pH of the buffer initially, 3.15? Do we agree? All right, now let's figure out the concentration of the hydroxide that I added. I get this directly from the problem. The problem says I take a one liter sample and I add 0.1 moles to it. Again, if I had given that to you in grams, you would obviously convert it to moles. And if I had given this volume to you in milliliters, you would have converted it to liters, right? Molarity is moles over liters because I can only put a molarity in my ice table. So I get 0.1 molar. Do we agree there? Now what's going to happen? The base that I add is going to add with, it's going to react with the weak acid, right? So here's my weak acid. Here's my base. I'm getting water and salt. Spectator here is potassium ion. Who cares? All right, so here's the actual equation that matters. Right, this is what I'm going to base my ice table off because my HF, my acid component, is going to react with my base to give me water and the anion. So now I get my ice table set up, right? That was in the buffer initially, that was in the buffer initially, and that's what I added. Remember, we're assuming that this is fully reacting, which means it goes all the way down to zero. So if this goes down by 0.1, then this is gonna go down by 0.1, which means that by law of conservation of mass, this is gonna go up by 0.1, right? Is everybody with me on how we set up this ice table? Does this part make sense? Because if here doesn't make sense, then the next step's gonna be nonsense. Do we see why this one went up and this one went down, right? It's reacting with the acid, so you would expect the acid component to go down and you would expect the base component to go up. And so now you can either make a second ice table or plug into one of these equations that I just showed you. Again, the choice is yours. It's essentially doing the same thing. So I picked this version, right? Plugging in HA, plugging in A minus KA coming from the problem. So I got 3.25. You also could have used Henderson Hasselbach. This value goes here, this value goes here. Take the negative log of this, and it goes right here. So again, it's really just a matter of, do you want to take the log at the end, or do you want to take a log at the beginning? They're the same thing, right? These are the exact same thing. You're going to get 3.25 by the way. And so there's the buffer by itself. There's the buffer adding base. So is that a reasonable 
Finding, would you expect the pH to go up after you add base? Yes. Will we call this a, a good buffer? It's decent. It went up from 0.1 to 0.2, right? So it went up a tenth. It's not like it went up 0.9, right? It went up 0.1. pH units. Does everybody understand this one? We have consensus on the answers. Yeah. So if I got 3.26, did you count that wrong? Uh, it's probably just how you round it here. Yeah. So no, I wouldn't count that wrong. All right, now let's change gears and look at what happens when we add acid. Now we're adding acid to a buffer. So, oops, that shouldn't say base. <laughs> that should say adding acid. Copied and pasted that slide, can you tell? Adding acid should decrease the pH. Right? Why should acid additions decrease the pH because where's the pH range for acids? Less than seven, so zero to seven, right? So if I'm adding acid, that should drop my pH. If I'm adding base, that should increase my pH, if it changes at all. Sometimes you might not even see a pH change at all, depending on how much acid you add, to what quantity, and how good the buffer was. So let's do this one together. What is the pH of a buffer made from 0.8 molar hydrofluoric acid and 0.8 molar lithium fluoride? So the same system that we were just dealing with a minute ago. After we add 10 milliliters of 2 molar hydrofluoric acid, and we're taking a 1 liter sample. So we're taking 10 mils of 2 molar HCl. Is HCl a strong acid or a weak acid? That's a strong acid, right? HCl is a strong acid. So we're taking a one liter sample of our buffer and we're adding 10 mils of two molar hydrochloric acid to it. We're going to see what happens. Can you do the same thing just like the buffer quality? For the initial pH, you could. Yeah, yeah. To get the initial pH, the initial pH would just be the pKa, yes. But then we'll have to do a new ice table for figuring out what it'll be after we add the acid. But yes, the initial pH would just be the pKa. Only if these two values are the same. All right, so we're ready to go through how to do this. Now remember, the procedure is different because when we add an acid, is an acid going to react with the acid component or the base component? It's going to react with, the, react with the base component, right? Acid plus base, right? Two acids aren't going to do anything to each other. Adding the acid is going to react with the base component, the A minus component, right? So the acid that we add completely reacts with the base component. And I'll give us new values here, right? That we then put into some sort of ice table. So a few minutes ago, we figured out the concentration of hydroxide that we added. Now we need to figure out the concentration of hydronium that we added, right? Because HCl is a strong acid, so that means if it's two molar HCl, we gotta figure out what the concentration is. But the factor, the problem is, we have to deal with the volume of it and the volume of the buffer, okay? It's not just two. If you say the concentration of H3O plus that's added is two, you're grossly, uh, being negligent because you've got to factor in the fact that you only added 10 mils of it and you added it to a total volume of one liter. So let's think back to the molarity equation. Molarity is equal to moles over liters, right? We learned that in like week four of, no, week three of Gen Chem 1, right? Molarity is equal to moles over liters, yes? So how do I get moles by itself? Moles by both sides by liters, right? Number of moles is molarity times liters, yes? Please tell me we agree with this statement, right? To get moles is just volume times molarity. Therefore, to get the concentration that I added, I've got to factor in the fact that I only added 10 mils of this two molar stuff, and I added it to a one liter sample. So, I'm just taking this, moles times liters, that's giving me my numerator, and then the volume is V total. In other words, got to factor in the fact that it's 10 mils added to one liter, okay? Molarity is moles over liters, so I get moles and I divide it by liters. So the problem told me it was two molar, and the problem told me I added 10 mils of it, and then where's this V total coming from? Right, 
That's this volume plus this volume, okay? Because we've got to remember, we've got to keep everything in molarity. If you just write H3O plus concentration added is two, you're not factoring in the fact that you only had 10 milliliters of it and you added it to a one liter sample, okay? So in other words, you're diluting it significantly. If you just wrote two, well, boy, you're off a lot. Does everybody see how we got this value? You gotta factor in the fact that yes, it was two molar, and hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, but we had 10 mils of it in a one liter sample. So we get number of moles, molarity times volume, so moles over liters. Number of moles over total volume. So we are diluting this, right? We're diluting it a good bit. We went from 0.2 molar to 0 0.0198 molar. We diluted it. Does everybody understand this part? Everyone with me here? How much acid did I add? H3O plus concentration was 0 0.0198. Okay, let's look at the, the chemistry again. The acid is uh, reacting with the base components, right? This is the conjugate base. And so here's the net ionic equation. Remember, I told you it's lithium fluoride. Well, who cares what the cation is? It could be sodium fluoride, whatever, who cares? That's a spectator. So the acid that we add reacts with the conjugate base. Acid plus base makes water and salt. All right, so the salt is actually now my weak acid. I'm getting my weak acid back. The weak acid that I'm getting back is actually my salt. Does everybody see where this equation came from? This is just a double displacement reaction, right? Because if you take this H, dump it right here, there you go, that gives you H2O left over. We cool on how we got this chemistry, the chemistry of what happened. All right, so now we just make our new ice table. This was, oops. My arrows got all funky, right? This was from the buffer already. This was from the buffer already. I just switched the order here, that's all. You're assuming this goes all the way down to zero, right? H3O plus that I added goes all the way down to zero. If this goes down by 0 0.0198, the other reactant is also going down by 0 0.0198. And law of conservation of mass says that the product is gonna go up by that same amount. Now I have everything I need to plug into either Henderson Hasselbach or the other version. I mean, you can make a second ice table. I think it's unnecessary writing, but you could do it. It's just, I don't feel like it's an unnecessary exercise unless you just want to write it out. Then by all means, do it. Right? But now we've got A minus, we've got HA. We can plug it into Henderson Hasselbach. We can plug it into the non-logarithmic version. You're gonna get the same answer regardless. So pick the one you like most. I don't care which one you pick, you're gonna get the same answer either way. So I used Henderson Hasselbach this time just because I used the other version in the last example, just to shake things up. So if the Ka is 7.1 times 10 to the negative fourth, how do I get a pKa? I just take the negative log. A minus HA 3.13. Could have plugged into the other version and taken the log at the end, you'll get the same answer. Does everyone see how this one worked? So let's compare. The buffer by itself was 3.15. Adding the acid brought it down to 3.13. Would you expect a buffer to have a small change like that? Yes. If it were unbuffered, it would drop down big time, like way down. But because it is buffered, right, you only saw a change in the hundredths place. Would you expect the pH to drop if it changes at all when we add acid? Would adding acid lower the pH? Yes. If there's any change to be had, it would be a lowering, right? Because acids have pHs between 0 and 7, so adding an acid should lower the pH. And this is not a big change. Right? Remember, this is the hundredths place, 
And this is a logarithmic base 10 scale. All right, so you try this one. You go in the lab and prepare a buffer using 0.7 molar acetic acid, and there's its Ka, and 0.6 molar sodium acetate. Two things. What's the initial pH of just the buffer? And then what's the pH after adding 20 milliliters of, point one, of one molar HCl to 500 mil sample? So I'll pause the video and let's try this one. So first thing we need to do is calculate where we are to begin with. What's the initial pH of this buffer? I got 4.68. Did you? 4.68. You could have used either version here, whichever makes you happy. Do you want to take the log at the end, or do you want to take the log at the beginning? Makes no difference to me. Now let's figure out how much H3O plus do we add? What's its concentration? Right? So moles over liters, we need to get moles by molarity times volume, and then we get total volume here, right? So moles over moles, that goes here, liters goes here. So it's one molar, 20 mils, so that gives me a number of moles, and then volume comes from adding these two values. Do we agree here? Because you've got to figure out the concentration of hydronium that we added, because I can only put high uh, concentration into my ice table. So 0 0.0385. Now let's look at the chemistry. The acid that we add is going to react with the conjugate base. And so we don't care about sodium, it's the spectator who cares. My hydronium that I added is reacting with my conjugate base to give me water and my acetic acid back. Right? So now this is what I'm going to use to base, excuse me, my ice table on. All right, so there's my reaction that I'm looking at. This is from the buffer. Uh, this is what I added, excuse me, this is what was added. These were from the buffer initially. All right, I'm just trying to keep it in the same order that I wrote it up here. I added 0.385 molar, it goes down to zero which means both reactants are going to go down by 0.385 moles per liter, which means the product is going to go up by 0.385 moles per liter. Do we agree on the ice table and where we get these numbers? Because one of them is always going to go up, one of them is always going to go down. Now we can plug into either one of your choosing. I don't care which one you pick. I think I picked henderson Hasselbach again. Yep, I did. All right, so there's the pKa. I got 4.62 as my new pH. Let me ask you this. Can you keep adding acid forever and ever and ever? And, and you know, that, went, that one changed a little bit more than the previous one. It was originally 4.7, what? Oh, it was 4.68 initially, excuse me. 4.68 to 4.62, right? That dropped a little bit more than some of the other ones we've seen. We added it to a smaller volume. Right? The buffer volume was only 500 mils last time, and this time. But it's still a decent buffer, right? I mean, it didn't jump a huge quantity. But can you add HCl just forever? I mean, is this, gonna, is this thing going to be able to resist change forever and ever and ever? Can I add, you know, two liters to this? No. Okay, that's called buffering capacity. Your buffer can only resist so much change. And tomorrow in lab, you're gonna investigate buffering capacity. All right, there's one last thing that we need to talk about. If you are trying to make a buffer in the lab, how do you pick which acid to use? Because you don't just pick any old acid arbitrarily. You wanna pick an acid that has a pKa close to the pH where you want the solution's pH to be. So if you want a pH of four, as your buffer, you need to pick an acid that's got a pKa really, really close to four, okay? And then the best buffering is gonna occur when this ratio is about one. In other words, when the pH is approximately pKa. So again, you want this quantity, remember in some of the problems I said 0.5 molar and 0.7 molar, or 0.6 molar and 0.5 molar. The best buffering is when this value, these are the same. 
you want these two values to be the same, so that the pH is equal to the pKa. So how do you choose the acid that you use? Well, you pick the, it's based on the buffer, where you want the buffer to stay. Okay, if you want the pH to be three, then lactic acid would be a good choice. Right, if you want the pH to be six, carbonic acid would be a good choice. So let's just do this one together real quick. You need a pH 4.3 buffer, and you only have these acids and their salts in your stock room. So how would you figure out which one's the best? Do you go off of the Ka? What do you go off of? pKa, right. So if these are the Ka's, these are the pKa's, how did I go from here to here? Negative log. So if my desired pH is 4.3, and these are the only ones I've got to pick from, which one's my winner? Benzoic acid, All right? All right, that's where we're gonna stop for today. I know we covered a lot of ground. We're gonna be doing enrichment on this on Friday. So I'll see you tomorrow for lab. Have a good day.